Hello everyone. This is Putnam County historian Larry Tippin. We've been doing a series, Early History in Putnam County. Recently, the retired teachers of Putnam County asked me to talk about some of the early history related to schools. So we had some technical problems that day. So what we're going to do is record that presentation again with the slides working this time. And anybody else that's interested in the early education in Putnam County, This is a publication published by the retired teachers to the early history of the schools in Putnam County. It's an excellent resource if you'd like to learn about some of the early schools we had and some really nice photos of some of the classes in some of those schools. I'm not going to repeat what's in that book today. I'm going to talk more about the progression of the laws and how the, uh, they're affected by the uh, schools are affected by the laws and the changing in the laws. There's also several other histories been written about schools like Clinton Township wrote a nice history of their schools and several others. I found in my research a really nice publication called A History of Education in Indiana published 1892 all the way back in 1892. Very thorough very well sourced um, publication with a lot of good information. We're going to be using some of that today in our discussion of the schools. We're going to start with the laws and all the way back to the ordinance of 1787. This was an ordinance that was adopted by the United States Congress in its early days, sponsored by Thomas Jefferson when he was still a member of the Commerce, uh, Congress. And basically, it was to govern the new territories that were getting ready to open up north and west of the Ohio River, what we typically call the Midwest, which includes Indiana. Back in the early days, the United States government was funded almost solely by the sale of lands that they would acquire from other governments or um, by the treaties with the natives and so forth. So they'd buy, uh, they would sell the land and you'd buy the land for maybe a dollar an acre, a dollar and a quarter an acre. That's the source of revenue. So they wanted some structure. This ordinance of 1787 provided that we would plot out the counties into townships. The townships divided into sections, one mile square or about 640 acres the 36 sections in each township. And then also to be reserved section 16 of each township for the maintenance of public schools, which came to be known as the Township School Fund or the Congressional School Fund. So that meaning the sale of the land, the money from the proceeds of the land set aside for schools. But it's more of a theory than a practical application until Indiana became a state in 1816. The first constitution of the state adopted the grand vision of the ordinance of 1787. It said that section number 16 of every township, the sale of the land from section 16, granted to the inhabitants for the use of the schools. So that was uh, from the ordinance of 1787 for the constitution for the schools. And then also one entire township designated by the president of the United States, in addition to the section 16 for public education, shall be reserved for the use of a seminary of learning. That didn't really quite happen as in vision. And also an official known as a trustee of school lands was designated superintendent of school section, is what they called it in the original constitution. And also the constitution had a provision upon petition of 20 householders in any township, there might be ordered an election at which three trustees will be chosen to manage the schools of the township. So three people were in the schools. They were given unlimited power, but neither money nor resources. So the schools were neither free nor were they equal. But think about the concept of common schools. 
This originated in New England in the 1700s, possibly in Boston, possibly in Philadelphia, possibly both, by Horace Mann and other early educators with the concept that schools should be open and free to all students and then supported by public funds. And also, it would have a common education. You would have, um, you know, commonly and widely recognized skills such as reading, writing, basic arithmetic, and so forth. Since the first Indiana Constitution did not include provisions for collecting taxes and the sale of the lands in Section 16 were slow to develop, Early schools were by subscription, and they were called subscription schools, where neighbors would promise or subscribe funds to hire teachers and purchase the material to provide some basic education for the children. And if a teacher was hired and that teacher was not local, the subscribers would take turns housing the teacher, and the education occurred wherever it could either in rotating basis in the homes of the subscribers, a barn, a church, whatever they had. This is very interesting. This is the 1879 history of Putnam County. I'm talking about in the Clinton Township section, start here. The first grist mill was put up in the year 1825 by Captain Goodwin on Little Walnut Creek. Like many others, of this days, it was a wet weather mill, meaning an old link could run when the water was running. And Captain William Thornburg, so well known to the citizens of Putnam County, taught the first school in Clinton Township at Captain Goodwin's mill. So you can almost picture the young students sitting on the bags of grain or whatever with their little slate tablets trying to get basic education when they could in this mill when the water wasn't running, the mill wasn't operating. <clears throat> and also, a few years later, after the Constitution was adopted, the Seminary Law of 1818, Pacifica said that fines assessed for any breach of the penal laws were to be paid in the treasury of the county and apply to the public seminaries of that county. Well, today, we think of seminaries as a theological school of sorts that prepares the students for the ministry of religious uh, faith. These county seminaries were simply seminaries of learning, it had nothing to do with any religious affiliation per se. So locally, the first in Putnam County was the Green Council Center established in 1830. One advantage we have now during our research, we have access to the primary source documents that were really not that readily available even just a few years ago. And this is the Acts of the General Assembly from 1830. It says, being enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Indiana, John, John Cagill, Alexander Stevenson, Enos Slow, Lemon Knight, and Isaac Ash, shall be and hereby are constituted the body corporate politic by the name of style, president and trustees of the Green Council Seminary Society, and so forth and so on. This created the Green Council Seminary. This is a very important um, article in the banner all the way back 1938. You can go to the Hoosier Chronicles online, by the way, if you'd like to read some of these articles. And if you'd like, you could pause your presentation at any time or drag it, uh, the little button you have at the bottom, drag it and go back if they get ahead of you. But I'm going to read this one. This is important. The steps were by the trustees of the Green Council Seminary Society acquired the entire city block in Green Council, bounded by Madison, Gillespie, Austin, and Franklin Streets, was the site of the town's first educational building, as set out indeed record book A in the office of the county recorder. There were four lots in this um, seminary lot. 
Lots 29, 30, 43, and 44. We'll look at a map here in just a second. And also noted the transfer of the ownership. Lot 29 was given by Isaac and Catherine uh, Ash. And he was one of those first trustees of the seminary to be used as uh, promote learning and education. Lot 30 is given by John Baird, who is agent for the town of Greencastle and also for the county for the purpose of promoting and encouraging education. Lot 43 by Joseph and Harriet Orr. General Orr and his wife made this guarantee, hereby will forever warrant defend the quiet and peaceful profession of the said lot to the trustees for purpose of education. And then Lot 44 by Reese Eliza Hardesty. So this is an interesting article that kind of summarizes the early seminaries. This is from the banner in 1930. It's really hard to read. I apologize, it's not a very good copy. When they scanned some of these uh, old newspapers for the Hoosier Chronicle, some of them were already badly faded. And this was one, it's almost impossible to read. So they're reminiscing from the publication in the Hoosier Visitor or The Visitor from 1842. That was one of the early newspapers in Putnam County. You had the Western Plowboy and several others. And this was from the visitor in 1842. And they're talking about DePaul. It says the Indiana Asbury University, which is what it was called at that time, has between 70 and 80 students. Talking about the second session of the Greencastle Female Seminary. And then if you want to pause and try to read the list of fees and so forth, you could do so. And then the Putnam County Seminary. So this is separate from the city seminary, the town seminary, actually. Green Council was at City Church in 61. This is a separate second seminary called the County Seminary. Now here's another attempt that I tried to enhance that article to try to read a little better. It's not much better than the first attempt. If you want to try to pause and read either one of these, feel free to do so. This is a painting by Elijah Cowgill. It's at the Putnam County Museum currently. So he painted the, the Putnam County Cemetery constructed in 1839. So this is not the first city seminary. This is the county seminary, which was nine years later. This is a map that shows where there were the lots we were talking about that made up the first city seminary were right here, two blocks west of the courthouse. And then the county seminary was down here, at the corner of Seminary and Ephraim streets. Back in those days, what we now know is College Avenue is called Ephraim Street in honor of Ephraim Dukes, the founder of Greencastle talk about the founding of Greencastle in a separate article, separate presentation. But the, all the references say the corner of seminary and Ephraim streets was where the first county seminary was. We believe it was the southeast corner where in 1864 they had the city school. Continuing with the legislation and the changes in law, in 1824, the General Assembly enacted an act to incorporate congressional townships providing for public schools. And under this act, as under preceding law, three trustees would be elected from each township. The trustees were not necessarily well-educated or educators themselves. And I don't mean that in a bad way as, as we have now in our current school uh, corporations. The Board of Trustees may not necessarily be educators but they're responsible for the tax money and so forth. So the early elected three trustees were not necessarily educators. Those township officers examined the teachers and granted license more or less on a piecemeal fashion initially. And then the examinations would typically cover reading, writing, arithmetic, and so forth, so on, maybe geography. And then the test 
if it could be dignified by just a name, was usually very simple, and in some cases could just be had for the asking. If they could find anybody that was willing to take on this position, they were usually hired. It's very difficult to find teachers or qualified teachers in the early days. Continuing with, then with the legislation, Act 1831 added a school commissioner for each county whose function was that of a financial agent for the local schools. Then the voters of the school district, which I'd be termed a school could be decided, would, would then decide how much local tax, if any, would be levied for the schools. However, it noted that no person to be liable for tax who does not or does not wish to participate in the benefit of the school fund, which basically is a voluntary tax, which worked out just about as well as you'd expected because people were not really paying the taxes and basically had the equivalent of subscription schools. 1833, an act incorporating congressional townships providing public education therein contained 205 sections and was very elaborate, very elaborate, retained the school commissioner of each county and three trustees for each township. Also interesting noted, the township trustees were exempt from military service. Because you couldn't have them, you couldn't have the trustee uh, going off to war or whatever. At that time, because we weren't in any, engaged in any war, but they for military service. And also, I thought this was quite interesting, every able-bodied male person being a freeholder or householder of the district at the age of 21 or upward shall be liable to work two days on just schoolhouse or to provide the equivalent in money, basically, to furnish the schoolhouse. So we're starting to build some schools now in 1833. And then this is how the labor was provided. You didn't have a choice. If you're 20 and older, you had to do so. However, it noted each householder was left to fulfill his own contract with the teacher for tuition, fuel, fuel and contingencies. So other than the building of the schools, it's still basically subscription schools. There's a lot of controversy about using public funds and taxation for schools in the early days, many people were strongly against the use of public funds for education. It was noted that one member of the General Assembly in 1837 is quoted as saying, when I die, I want it to be said, here lies an enemy of free schools. This was a member of the General Assembly. And also a commentator from that period of time said, the state of common education is truly alarming only about one child in eight between the ages five and 15 is able to read. The common schools and competent teachers are few. This is very interesting. This was in that 1892 book that I was showing you about full of useful information. They had a statewide vote to determine if the voters wanted to use tax money for public schools. And basically, it's very confusing, but basically, they're saying in the various counties, alphabetically, how, what the percentage was that said yes, and then the rank of, of the counties at that time. You see down here with Pulaski County, 91% said that they wanted to use tax money to support the schools, which was the third, ranked third of the counties at that time. Well, for uh, Putnam, unfortunately, only 22% wanted to use tax money for public schools, which was 85% or 85th of the counties at that time. So very few people wanted to support public schools from Putnam County. For continuing with the progression of the laws, the law of 1849, it increased the extent benefit of the common schools and then said that there shall be annually assessed, collected and paid for the purpose of increasing the common school fund. Various revenues, and then it became known as the county common school fund. And also then they created some tax structure where each person 
liable to pay a poll tax of 25 cents annually. Now, poll tax in this context is merely a tax on each person in your household. So if you had mom, dad, four kids, that's six people in the household, you're paying $1.50 for the purpose of public schools each year. And also in that law, the business of each district shall be transacted by one district trustee who shall be elected annually from the, by the legal qualified voters of that district. By 1851, the state decided the original constitution written in 1816 is outdated and it's been amended so many times that we might as well just rewrite the whole thing, which is what they did in 1851. And the section of the schools provided for general and uniform system of common schools where tuition shall be without charge and equally open to all and further refined the common school fund, saying the principal of the common school fund shall remain a perpetual fund, which may be increased, but shall never be diminished and the income thereof shall be appropriated for the purpose of support of common schools and no other purpose whatsoever. The common school fund still exists today. It's still in the books, but it's never been adjusted for inflation. So the schools now, the school corporation, of course, made up more than one township. For instance, Greencastle Schools is Greencastle Township and Madison Township. Uh, the North Putnam Schools are the six townships in the northern part of the county and so forth and so on. So each of those school corporations now still get what would have been the township interest on the common school fund. It's not very much money, a few hundred dollars, but they still get it and it's still on the books. All right, the school law of 1852, just the very next year after the constitution was rewritten, that the school matters were delegated to the civil township and the duties the township officers, officers specified in detail. So under the new revised state constitution, the township then became the primary unit of government in the state of Indiana, and the township trustee is responsible for roads, schools, and everything within that township. Moving on. Also, that law specifically said each trustee was to count the children within their respective townships between the ages of seven and 17, breaking out between the ages of seven and 12, 12 and 17 years, and then establish graded schools or the modification thereof. So up until this time, you didn't have graded schools. I mean, the early schools, of course, you maybe have half a dozen to a dozen students. The young ones sat in the front, and then the ones that were uh, still going to school, not yet graduated, so to speak, were in the back. And most of the lessons, they couldn't read or write, so most of the lessons, they sang out. So they did the ABC song every single day. And then also the 30 days half September, which we still use when you try to determine which months have 30 days. Admit it, you do. I know you do. I do too. But they sang the lessons out. It's what they did. And they didn't have grades. So now in 1852, they're going to have grades where you'd have a, a common textbooks or learning for each grade level. And then when the school year ended, you either promoted to the next grade level or you were not. Also, the law direct, this law of 1852 directed the levy of 10 cents for each $100 property tax to be appropriate exclusively for support of common schools. So the state is now for the first time taking financial responsibility for common education by levying property taxes, essentially. Opposition to the law appeared on every side among the cases about trial was one in Putnam County about Alexander Black. He was protesting the collection tax under this law. There was another case in Switzerland County related to the city schools there, I believe in Vivi, 
but this is the major one that had to do with us, and it came from right here in Putnam County. At the April 1853 election in Greencastle Township, a vote was taken upon the proposition to assess a tax of 15 cents for each $100 of assessed valuation of property and 25 cents for each person for common school purposes. Now, as Alexander Block had a significant interest in this, you see the map of 1864 of Putnam County provided by the Library of Congress. It's available online if you want to try to find it. So this block owns 160 acres here just west of Greencastle. He also owns at least 240 acres of Madison Township. But it's this part in Greencastle Township where he bought the suit. The assessment was made, Black instituted the suit, which went all the way to the state Supreme Court as Greencastle Township in Putnam County and Kirchival as County Treasurer versus Black. The state Supreme Court held the tax provisions of law of 1852 were unconstitutional. Not just, not the education per se, but the tax portion of it or the, uh, the concept of having to pay taxes to support education and having no say so in the matter was determined by state Supreme Court to be unconstitutional. As a result, the school term was short for two and a half months. The many schools closed altogether. That 1892 history we're talking about, which is so full of useful information, noted that 3,000 teachers received for their services an average of $21.42 a month or the $54.41 for a year and a half salaries. He said that real teachers were driven to other occupations or open private schools. Now, I wonder how the tax supported schools, in many cases, they're only open like this noted for two, two and a half months. And as some parents were still doing education by subscription for maybe two more months or so but in addition to supplementing just the very short two and a half months of education provided for in 1852. So as a result of this, the legislature um, enacted the school law of 1855, reworded the previous law, and they gave a strong rebuke, a very strong rebuke to the state Supreme Court and the court system in general basically indicating that the courts were exercising far too much overreach of their authority where the elected officials were the ones to write the laws and then the courts had no authority to just to strike the laws down so they had to live with the laws A very strong rebuke to the court system providing that the uh, taxes raised for schools were legal provided they were uniform and fair and also they created city and town schools so in other words city and towns could constitute a school corporation independent of townships what was happening up to that time you'd have a tax assessed for a whole township but you'd have a concentration where the town was uh town was situated or a city where you would have maybe in the rural areas half a dozen to a dozen school uh students in the school where in the towns may have 50 or even 100 so the city schools and the town schools are disproportionately less per student because of that. <clears throat> so now then they're created separate town schools and township schools. And that system existed uh, all the way up to until 1965 when they started the school consolidation. So you had many places you had a town school and a township school. Also, Law of 1865 is interesting is that English would be the primary language. You know, English is not the official language of the United States, never has been. But at least in Indiana, it was the primary language taught beginning in 18, uh, 1865. So you typically you think that if you have a, uh, an immigrant that came from another country, the students would be teach, uh, talking the old language at home, usually German or maybe Swiss or whatever. But in schools, they had to do English. I thought that was kind of interesting. 
And then in 1873, the legislature created the county superintendency law, where now you had a countywide superintendent oversee all the matters of the schools in that county. The county superintendent was elected by the township trustees and created a common curriculum for all the schools in that county, developed in consultation with the trustees. So the trustees and the countywide superintendent would collectively decide which schools, uh, which textbooks would be appropriate for each level of school and so forth in each grade. And also, the county superintendent was required to visit each school at least once. Now you think about it, that uh, once per school year, and you think about it, the townships would have maybe six, eight, 10, maybe a dozen schools. So we had 13 townships, and then starting um, in the 1860s, we have Mill Creek, which had three schools. So there were well over 100 schools in Putnam County at the time. So the superintendent had to visit one of them, every one of them at least once school year. Now this is from schools in your hand. I didn't alter it. I didn't try to verify the dates or anything like that. This is straight from schools in your hand where they listed the school superintendents. It existed almost a hundred years. If you'd like to pause and read those or go to the schools in your hand and read a little more about it, feel free to do so. I'm gonna move on. And then, uh, also in 1873, that 1892 history we've been talking about had an interesting facts. Said that the average length of school term statewide in 1868 was 87 days, 120 days, 1875, and then 131 days by 1890. I thought that was an interesting figure. Also, in 1873, they had a minimum standards for high school. Now we're getting into high schools now. Now before that, typically you'd be lucky to get education equivalent of sixth grade now, or maybe even eighth grade, but that was it. You really didn't have anything past that. So now they're provided for high schools. Now they've got some tax money to work with. We can have high schools, but as you're a freshman, you didn't just show up and ask, where's my seat? You had to have a basic competency and all these subjects, oh my gosh, orthography, if, I, if I'm pronouncing it right, is the art of writing, reading, geography, grammar, arithmetic, United States history, composition, word analysis, four books of geometry, algebra to the general theory of equations, Latin, Latin, and more Latin. So you couldn't just walk in and say, where's my seat? So the end, I had a lot of preparatory schools. DePaul had a good one, and we're gonna look at several preparatory schools throughout the county in a minute. That would create a means for a student to have that basic level so they could even enter high school as a freshman. I thought that was quite interesting. And this is from that 1892 book again. So it says when the first high schools were organized, Evansville in 1850 and so forth, so on, and Greencastle 1868, when the population of Greencastle was 4,500. Also listed the private schools and seminaries. Now this was a long list. You could see that I, I cut and pasted for presentation purposes, the ones that applied to us. The female seminary of 1830. Now, I don't know if that female seminary was the first city school that was renamed as a female seminary, but that had to be the first city school of Greencastle. The female collegiate institute, 1848, and the Clovidal Seminary in 1850. This is interesting. As a new paper wrote, 1859, the Clovidal Seminary was only successful for about five years or so, and then by 1859, you can see, if you'd like to pause and read it, or you can go to the Hoosier Chronicles and get this article. They were basically closing down operations and selling the building and the property the building stood on. Also listed some of the private schools. Private schools were typically supported by a religion of some sort because they had no other funding. 
They had the Lagoda Academy in 1858, Bainbridge Academy, then the female college of Indiana, located in Greencastle, by the Presbyterians, not the Methodists, as you would think, not affiliated with DePaul University. Here's an article for the Bainbridge Male and Female Academy from 1859. Pause if you like, basically talking about the upcoming school year, the fee schedule, and so forth and so on. Move on. Also at the Russell Academy. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these when I talk about their respective towns and other presentations. But the Russell Academy was donated by Jacob and Rachel Durham, the large three-story brick building on the uh, west side of town, east of the Durham Cemetery, known various times as the Russell Academy, the Russell Classical Academy, Harmonia College, Harmonia, opened its doors for students in 1856, said to have up to 250 students at its peak. And then enrollment decline was discontinued entirely in 1871. So in the early 1860s, the institution came under the control of the Methodist Northwest Indiana Conference. And we see that Jacob and Rachel Durham deeded the land to the trustees, Russell Seminary, in 1861. At that time, the academy then began to refer to as Harmonia. That's when the name changed, apparently. Also had a boarding house, so forth. Very interesting article. If you'd like, to just pause and read it, or you go to the uh, banner, 1868, read it if you'd like. I had to chop it up into several pieces just for presentation, but they're talking about the 1868, 1869 school year, who the board of trustees were, the teachers, and so forth, so on. And the fee schedule, you have the primary classes, the preparatory classes, academic, first year, second year, third year, and then collegiate studies, junior, middle, and senior, and then classical studies with preparatory classes and collegiate, and then the fee schedule for each. Then you can have uh, enrollment for music and so forth if you want to pay extra. So this is for the 12 week terms. You'd have three terms a year. So for a full school year, it'd be three times this. <clears throat> and then finally, that article ended up talking about the boarding. Typically, they had a boarding house, so $3.50 a week, or you could board with private citizens of the town. Again, pause if you'd like to read it. And this was the building. There's an interesting article in the Banner Graphic, 1973. They're saying this is when they think it's... Uh, these are students on the roof, but I think it's actually the workers that are dismantling the school, which was taken apart in 1899. All right, let's jump to training of the teachers. Most of this came from that 1892 history. It's very interesting. That's basically the, the main ways of training teachers was the pedagogics, if I'm pronouncing that right, of the Indiana University, which is the methods of teaching the state normal school, the state normal school was in Terre Haute. The state decided that they would basically let the different cities to bid for the right to have the school. Terre Haute bid $25,000 and a promise of, uh, I think, 20 acres of land in addition to that. And they won. They bid the most, so they got the state normal school, later to be Indiana State University. For a brief period of time, Paul had a normal school. There was also a normal school in Richmond. And the county institutes and the township institutes were very interesting. A lot of times in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s even, the township trustees would require the teachers as a condition of their employment to one day a month, usually a Saturday, to participate in the county institute or the township institutes basically were the teachers themselves would get together and talk about the schools, what's working, what's not working, and so forth, and help them further their learning and education. And then also related to that was a teacher's reading circle, which is about exactly what it sounds like, not like a book of the month club, but a little bit like that. 
that sometimes in lieu of the, the township or county institute, sometimes in conjunction with them. This is a listing from 1892 history about some of the independent normal schools. And they list two that I thought were very interesting, not any relation to Putnam County, but they're still interesting enough to discuss. At the Central Indiana Normal School in Ladoga, and then the Central Normal College and Commercial Institute in Danville, both opened in 1876 come across an article from Fort Red, which is now Barnard, in 1878, where they're saying on Friday night, quite a train of buggies passed through here, transferring students and their property from Ladoga to Danville. Of course, there's no train at that time. They mean train of buggies, meaning a long line of horse-drawn buggies, transferring the students from Ladoga to Danville. Then the Lagoga Academy then basically consolidated the Danville Academy, later became the uh, Central Normal School where a lot of teachers were taught to teach, basically. That's very well known. That's gonna be interesting. And then initially in Teachers Lodge, it was up to the tenth trustee and predecessors to come up with the means for licensing the teachers and what kind of uh, requisite knowledge they had to have. Sometimes in the old days, all they had to do was show up and say they were interested. Then the License Law of 1855 provided some standards and uniformity in the licensing. Early days, they had these various subjects. You had to master to get a license. And then 1865, then there's more formal procedures for examining teachers. And then it had very specific and systematic uh, ways and manners for licensing the teachers and what kind of tests they had to pass in order to be able to teach. And then it fixed the licenses. That initially had four grades of certification for six, 12, 18, 24 months. Then 1883, the 18 month license was discontinued. And the six month was basically then a trial license. The provision was made for three years certification and continuing, provided for the granting of a lifetime license for teachers, so they didn't have to constantly apply for the license every year, every few years, but they had to pass a very rigorous examination and had to have 36 months of experience of teaching, at least 10 of those in Indiana, and a high degree of proficiency in the theory of teaching. Moving on. And demonstrate the comprehensive knowledge of six branches at that time. Physiology, history of the United States, elementary algebra, geometry, the first principle of natural, natural philosophy, geometry, botany, Frederick, mental, moral science, Constitution of the United States, and Indiana State School Law. So you see it's very comprehensive and very detailed uh, requirement to have the uh, lifetime teacher's license. Not, not anybody could just do it. It's very difficult. That'd be very good at it. But they did try to help, and they didn't just surprise you with a pop quiz type test. Sometimes they even tell you which books you might want to study. So here's 1893, superintendent of the county schools in Putnam County, said beginning November examination to be held and recommended these two books you might want to study, which I'm quite certain they did, and so forth. And then also about the township institutes and then, also, and then also, the, it's suggested that they would study them together at the Township Institute. So you had a, a collective group of people that were helping each other study, which is very interesting. This is from Schools in Her Hand. I noticed a sample teacher examination just to give you an idea of how hard this test might be. And again, I'm quoting this directly from Schools in Her Hand. It, this test is not dated. 
but here's what you had to do. You had to identify the old steel gray figure, the philosopher of Highgate in the west of Twickenham. And also you had to write a short sketch on any one of these. And also there's this, on Nebo's Lonely Mountain, on the side of Jordan's wave, in the veil of the land of Moab, there lies a lonely grave. You are supposed to answer who is grave and characterize this person in six or eight lines. So you think you could pass this without setting for it? Of course not. I did, by the way, recognize one of these. I had one right without any preparation, just by sheer dumb luck. Well, if you'd like to pause and study this a while, you're more than welcome to, but we're going to go to the answers. Those steel gray figures was Mutz Valley, Italian diplomat, politician, historian, philosopher, writer, and playwright, poet, Renaissance period. This next one I knew, Karl Marx, who wrote you know, all the stuff about communists. I knew that he was buried in a suburb of London, which is called Highgate. And then the wasp of Trickingham was Alexander Pope. It's also called the Wicked Wasp of Twickenham for stinging literary satire of his fellow authors. And then, of course, the last one was Moses. Of course, we should have known that, right? I got one right. I got study some more if I'm going to be a teacher in Indiana. The interesting series of articles, 1929, about the history of those schools. So you can read this article if you'd like. This is just the headlines of it, so forth. I'm moving on to the second of that, where it's in June 3rd of 1929. County had the first school back in 1823. And they're saying in this article, their first school is located southwest of Ian Greenhouse on the forks of the Eel River, and so forth. Basically, where James Athey had his first cabin in Putnam County, which would be south of the Huffman Cover Bridge, if you're familiar with that area. However, 1879 history of Putnam County in the Russell Township section says the first schoolhouse was built on the farm of John Foster in 1823, in which the first school was taught the same year. So this is contradicting that saying also that the first school in Putnam County is in Russell Township. It's a common misconception the county was gradually settled from south to north, but that's not the case at all. We see that even before Putnam County is Putnam County, there's people of European descent interacting and trading with the neighbors, the natives, in along Raccoon Creek, Walnut Creek, Ramp Creek, and other waterways. So we know that there are people in Russell Township, and the first school may have actually been taught in Russell Township, and this would have been at Blakesburg. It's just a couple of interesting photos. They're not Putnam County schools. I just thought they were cool. We have them in our files at the Putnam County Museum. So this is what a typical school might have looked like back in the very early days. You can see it's got a window or hopefully two windows, a little wood stove of some sort. You can see the pipe. They had 10 students, all of them sitting together in the same school building, but one teacher. And then I wonder about this dog who's obviously delighted to be in the group photo of the students that day, whether he just hang around until the, the school day was over with somebody's dog or whatever. And then just another interesting photo, of possibly a school, what it might've looked like, not Putnam County, just from the Putnam County Library files. We also have Putnam County Museum, that's one of those. Okay, so that's it. That's some of the early history of the schools from a different perspective than what we're used to hearing. Again, if you want to learn more about the schools of Putnam County, go to the library, Schools in Your Hand, the Darius Township uh, publications on school and so forth. Thank you.